Hey everyone, I am super excited to be joined by Heather Parody. You can find more about her at heatherparody.com and also definitely subscribe to her podcast, The Unconventional Leaders Podcast. We had so much fun recording a couple. If you're listening to this on the podcast, you probably already heard the episodes we did. If you're watching this video on social media, then she's going to be on the podcast soon. So Heather, how's it going? It's going so great. We had such a fun time. It was uh, one of the most relaxed and fun interviews that I've done in a very long time. I'm so happy to hear you say that because that's what that that's the whole aim. It's to make it fun, make it relaxing, make it a process people actually enjoy. Because that's my whole thing. You got to enjoy the process, right? Yeah, and also too from like a guest perspective, because I think as hosts we're always thinking about the audience, which is great. We should audience is important, but also too you're a human being and I'm a human being, and we've got to just um, you know think about that interaction as well. So it's been really cool, you know, from the perspective of a guest. I'm so glad you said that because, you know, I always think about that adage in business, right? Where people say, you know, your employees come first as a business owner, take care of your employees or your staff or your team, and they'll take care of the client. And I think it's kind of the same in the podcast world where if you take care of your guests, they'll, it'll take care of the audience. But I don't Amen. think a lot of people think that way, right? That's pretty unconventional. You know, that's an unconventional it way is. of looking at it. Absolutely. But I, yeah. And I think, cause I think a lot of podcasters get so wrapped up in the numbers. It's like, yeah. and, and I've been on podcasts where, you know, I really like the host. I really like the show, but it's like such a rush job. It's like, let's record, let's schedule to record, get in here, let's record it. We get it out. We'll promote it. And that's the end of it. And I know yeah. it's all focused on how many downloads can I get? Yep. And yeah. it's not wrong, but it doesn't make me as the guest feel super valued. Yeah. And I have to imagine that it comes across in some way, shape or form energetically to the audience that way. Well, and guests know sometimes when people are like using them because they're a big name. And so it's like, oh, you want me to have, because I'm a big name and you think that you're going to get more downloads because of whatever, but it's not necessarily true. I've noticed, I don't know if you've seen this or not, that some of the guests who aren't well known have not only the best episodes, but also the best results. And I don't know if it's uh, because there's a comfort level there and it's not as rushed and it's not as, you know, uh, formal, but dude, it's, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> I've noticed the same thing. I'm so glad you brought that up. And I think here's my theory and follow me on this and just give me, okay. give me some thoughts. My theory is when you're a big name, right? You do a ton of podcasts or a ton of interviews or whatever. So there's not that urgency to promote or to get it out. It's just like, Oh, I just did another one. Now I'm on to the next thing. And yeah. you just kind of get lost in the shuffle. But when you're someone who is really trying to establish audience or to establish authority and expertise in your space, every little piece of media becomes vital. So it's I like, if I'm on the mm -hmm. podcast, I'm going to promote it and I'm going to promote it hot and heavy. And if, yep. you know, when the host promotes it, I'm going to share the heck out of it because yep. I want as many people to see that. And I've noticed that not only with me, but with our clients, when we're going mm -hmm. over their data, like they'll, they'll always come to me, a lot of them and be like, I can't believe I got so-and-so on my show. And that's awesome. But it's funny when you see the numbers and then you Doesn't see matter. the other person who nobody knows and it dwarfs those numbers. Yep. Exactly. Well, too, you know, uh, if, if you're doing the exact same interview and I, I know you've experienced this and me too, where I have somebody on the show and I'm like, I've heard you say this is our entire thing on somebody else's show. You won't ever say anything different. It's like this, this staple answer. Why would somebody, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to listen to Jan, um, I have to pick your podcast over somebody else's and they're both saying the exact same thing. So if I love Jan, I'm not going to listen to all these podcasts that are saying the same thing that Jan's been saying over and over again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, uh, let me, let's do this really quickly. I'm going to tell you my favorite thing as an interviewer and you, then okay. you tell me yours. So, and I'm okay. talking from the interaction standpoint. So a lot okay. of, a lot of people like when they're doing an interview and a guest like has to pause or they're like, that's a good question or a great question. But what I found is that becomes like a filler type of thing, right? They'll say Absolutely. that to a lot of things. Luckily, they do. What I love more than anything to hear is when we're in conversation and we're flowing and someone goes, uh, no one's ever asked me that before. Mm -hmm. And they said, that's my absolute favorite. Cause then I'm like, great. We're going to get something original here. And it makes them think in ways they haven't thought. So for me as an interviewer, every time I hear that, I get a little internal fist pump. Yeah. What's your favorite thing as an interviewer? The first five minutes before we hit record, um, 
that it's my favorite and least favorite, but it tells me everything that I need to know off the bat. Uh, first of all, if somebody's in a rush, if somebody's kind of, you know, okay, let's go ahead and get this started. Or if they're, you know, I don't want to respect their time. I don't want to just, you know, shoot the breeze for a long time. Cause I know that they're busy, especially, you know, some of the quote, quote, bigger name guests, whatever that means. Um, but I, I think that the first rapport building is my favorite, uh, it's meeting somebody new and it's also too such an honor at times because there's so many people you want to talk to and getting to just meet them is just really neat you know yeah that connection is is so important do you have a process for every guest that you go through and have you had guests that don't want to kind of play with that process they're like yes, i just want to i just want to do it my way and do my thing like how do you handle absolutely. that absolutely i respect it because you can't force somebody to go somewhere they don't want to go um the, the, all that I can do is what's up to me, which is creating the space and the environment. And like I mentioned uh, on, on the show that we reported, uh, getting really comfortable with myself, that if somebody's not opening up or, you know, it's, it's not going the way that I quote envisioned it to, that all I am responsible for is me and the energy that I bring and the sincerity and the environment that I create, that that's all that's in my hands. And if someone doesn't want to go there, that's not on me and that's okay. You know, there's going to be other guests and there's going to be other times. And I think just taking kind of the expectation out of it where it needs to be this way, it needs to have these sound bites and it needs to have blah, blah, blah. Uh, it, it releases me to have a little bit more fun and play and enjoy this because as you know, as a show host, this isn't the meat and potatoes of our business. We're doing this, you know, really from a service perspective, also creativity kick. We enjoy it. It's fun. Um, and if I rob it of its intention, which is just to be, you know, a, a creative expression of who I am and what I want to put out into the world, then it becomes a little bit more transactional. Uh, and that's not what I want it to be. Have you had interviews and shows that you've done that have never made it to the light of day, never made it to air? You're telling us secrets. <laughs> I know. I have. I'm just curious if you have. Yeah, I feel so bad for it. How do you um, handle that? It's different every time. It depends on the circumstance. Normally, those shows are the ones that people pitch to come on and I didn't really want to and I haven't I didn't get the balls to learn how to say no and I think having a process in place a, a kind of a, a blocker between you and guests sometimes is really good so having an application process or some kind of formality thing to really gauge the proper guests because you know when you're starting off you just want to interview everybody but I think especially if you want to do this like seriously you need to make sure that there's you know there, you, you want to make sure you're careful who you interview um, um, man, I, I was just talking about listening. I, I, I have ADD. Did I tell you that? Like, <laughs> it's really hard. Like I literally like, Oh, a squirrel, there's a squirrel outside. It's okay. Um, yeah. People who haven't made it to a lot of dates. So it depends. Usually it's the guests that I was hesitant on and I just did it because of some kind of weird pressure or I was worried about offending them or something like that. Um, sometimes I'll be honest and just tell them, uh, that, that this, I didn't, it wasn't something that I need to put out right now. Um, other times people are kind of, I feel like using the show to promote something. And if it's too promoty, I won't release it. And usually those people never even check back about it because they're doing like 50 million interviews in a row and they're just trying to get their books sold. Like I interviewed somebody the other day and they never said anything else than on my book, which you can pre-order. I'm not going to give it all away, but blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, are you joking right now? I mean, it was only like a 20 minute interview. So it wasn't like a huge thing. But I'm like, I can't, you know, it's out of integrity. There's also been times people have said things um, that are completely against uh, the values of what we're promoting in this show, like hardcore. <laughs> um, and I've just had to be honest about that. I'm like, I can't stand behind that philosophy. Have you ever had a gap? Like, what, what's, have you, let's get vulnerable for a second. What's your biggest gaff that you've made that you're like, I can't believe I said that? Or, I didn't want you like after the fact, you're like, oh, I wish I wouldn't have gone there with that person. Have you ever had those moments? Like I'll give you one uh, for me really quickly. An sure. example is I was recording with someone who I really, uh, who I really admire and had a great time. And I pronounced her name completely wrong because I didn't ask before the show. <laughs> so that was like, Oh, really that's the worst thing you've done. That's amazing. <laughs> um, I've, especially as you know, I've started interviewing a little bit higher you know, bigger names, people that I've, that have influenced my life. So like, that's been really weird. Um, and I, I think I mentioned this to you on another, one of the episodes that we recorded about, 
um, putting on some kind of fake presence. Um, sometimes I sound kind of like an asshole when I'm nervous or I, so I, I lean towards like a more of an asshole thing because I'm kind of like protecting myself. So I'll sound kind of harsh and kind of to the point and I'm not as funny. Like I don't let this side of myself show. And sometimes I'll re-listen to it and I'm like, I kind of sound like indifferent to this person because I'm so nervous. Um, and there's other times that, and I've had to catch myself where I act too nice and, oh yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And not hold my weight that I'm, you know, an equal contributor to this conversation. And so I've really had to deal with that. And there's not one thing that partic- that sticks out in my head per se, but I think just more of the energy and the air that I put off because of my own insecurity. I've, I've really been conscious of that, of like, Heather, just be you on this. It doesn't matter what their name is and how many books and millions, blah, 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 blah. like they just want to connect with you. Your audience wants the real Heather. Easier said than done. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Let me ask you this really quickly. Let's, let's keep going down this path just a hair. Let's put it out there right now. Who is your dream guest? Oprah. Oprah? Oprah listens to my show all the time. D- Oprah, I love you. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. I know that's not true, but I'm putting it out there. So why, why not? I just, she is but what so... If? It's going to happen. Right? Okay, what if me, she me... just comes across this right here? What if... Like someone who's watching this is like just sharing it out there. And someone who knows someone who knows Oprah, who knows someone and it just crosses her desk. And she's like, Heather, I'm going to make your day. I'm going to be on your show. It'll happen. Yeah. It'll happen. Why not? You have to put it out there, right? Yep. Yeah. It'll happen. I, I, I'm one of these people. I have really crazy dreams that I actually am that crazy enough to believe that they're going to happen. So if I told you all this stuff, you would be like, she's lost her. I'll make I'll make a pact with you right now if you're okay. willing to do this. If either one of us lands Oprah, we have to share Oprah with the other person. Done. <laughs> so if Oprah calls me, I'm gonna say I will not have you on Oprah unless you do Heather's show too. Awesome. Who who's your dream guest? <laughs> My dream guest. Oh, I never really thought about that. Let me think. Give me a second. Talk Heather about something Curry. for a second. <laughs> Talk about yeah, I'm good. I'm in. And I mispronounced her name. So I mean Come on. You're like, you're tripping about that way more than I am. Like, I wouldn't even remember No, because you don't understand that that's like a thing for me. I, I, every single guest. Why is that a thing? Let's talk about that. Why? Did somebody mispronounce your name? Nobody mispronounced my name. It was just, well, people mispronounce my name all the time, but it honestly doesn't bother me. Um, I think it's a thing because for whatever reason, somebody told me at one point that people's names are really, really, really important. So it's like the ultimate sign of disrespect for me to not even care how your name is pronounced when it's something so simple that I have control over. So that's why it makes me feel so bad that it's like, I didn't even take the two seconds to say, Heather, is this the correct way to pronounce your name? And I've done that with every guest up to this point. And most people laugh at me because their names are very easy to pronounce, but I still do it anyway out of habit. And you're the first person. I'm glad it happened with you though, I will say, because you took it like a champ. And I really appreciate that. But it is, that's why I'm so stuck on it because it's such an anomaly. Somebody told you this is like the most important thing. It's the ultimate sign of respect, maybe for them in their narrative. And I'm not saying you shouldn't care about that, but honestly, that is not the biggest sign of respect for me. I don't care how you pronounce my name. That is, that means nothing to me. The way that you interact and treat me in a conversation and treating me like a human, that is way more important than if you say parody or paraday. In fact, I think paraday kind of sounds cooler. So <laughs> you did me a favor. It's a little, yeah, it's a little, uh, what is it? Maybe it's a little European or something. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, Dream guest. Let's get back to that really quickly. Cause someone just popped into my mind and it's funny, but I think, and I was so close to landing this person. So, so close. I was like one degree away. Emeril Lagasse. I don't know who that is. He's a celebrity chef. Emeril oh, live. Wh- Emeril. Okay. I Chick-fil-A grew up watching like Emeril. For me. I don't know chefs. Okay. <laughs> well, he was like the, one of the guys that like built the food network. And I, when I was a kid, my grandfather and I used to watch his show and he was, you know, he, he getting to see men cook was a young kid, child, like, cause my mother always cooked. My dad never, he was working, didn't cook. But when I stayed with my grandfather who retired the year I was born, he would cook and we would see these guys on TV, like hmm. Emeril Lagasse, Bobby Flay, Malta Mario. And I was like, it's okay for men to cook. And I love food. 
And so that gave me the permission to go explore that and do that. And that's what led to me becoming a chef and the performance aspect, seeing someone who wasn't just like, kind of like a dentist, so to speak, or a doctor Mm -hmm. who's like Mm -hmm. all proper and what, Mm -hmm. like he was performing. It was fun. It was exciting. It was entertaining. And that's what led me down the path ultimately. So that's my dream. And I was so close because I worked with his team. What? Did they not get him on the show? Well, I worked with, yeah, I worked with his team to launch one of his cookbooks um, after I, you know, left the chef world was in the media world. And I was talking to his publicist and I had his publicist on one of my shows. And I said, how can I get Emerald on? I want to talk to him. And she's like, well, let me run it up the line and talk. And she would talk to a few people and she's like, oh, his schedule just doesn't work out. And then I dropped the ball because I was young and I just let it go. So I was Are like, you alive? I was, I was, I, I was in my mid twenties. I just like do it again. Yeah, Why I have. To, I should today. May fourteenth. <laughs> is, is that your challenge to me? I actually, yeah. I will. I will Why go. Not? I will go back down that route. No, it, it's not like I, I don't think he's he's a name in the chef world. Of course, I don't think he's like you. Don't know. You'd never heard of him until I mentioned it. So I mean, it's not like Martha Stewart or anything like that. But for me, it's like that's the guy that got well, me started that was he, that was seth godin for me and i did put off writing an email to him for three years like that's i was like at the very beginning i wrote my mm-hmm. journal i want to have seth godin mm-hmm. and i did it because i was scared out of my mind and i mm-hmm. asked him and he said yes this dude's gonna say yes to you you just gotta ask I'm gonna, me. i'll have to yeah i thank you for lighting that re- reigniting that flame i'm gonna go i'm gonna go reach out to some people and see what i can do but yeah that would be super them. exciting Go straight to social media. Like we're always like, I gotta go through. No, just go online. Go to his Instagram. DM him. Tweet him. He actually follows me on Twitter. And so here, let me. T- I'll tell you this story. Here, what? this is funny. Nobody knows this story. I'll tell you this really quickly, and I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this. But um, when I was interviewing his publicist, right, I had her on the show, and one of the questions I asked was, "When, when I'm on Twitter?" Because at that time, since I was working with his team, he would tweet me back his account. So I would tweet at him and he would tweet me back and we'd have like engagements and uh, people would see that we're interacting. And so I asked her on the show, I said, is that really him or does he have someone on his team operating his Twitter account? Which I thought was a fair question. And she kind of stumbled over her words and answered it. And then at the end, she's like, can you cut that out? Cause I wasn't prepared for that question. I'm like, you're a publicist. But anyway, so it was funny because it's, it, it's not someone on his team does his Twitter for him. Rightful. I, I, I get it. He's a celebrity. He's got millions of followers. Like that's what happens, but they didn't want to answer that question. Like it was like shrouded in mystery. So, you know, people who are in his space who you've collabed with. Yeah. That he knows that if you said to him, Hey, I, I interviewed so-and-so or I collabed with this person and that he would know who those people are. Probably. Yeah. It's just a matter of getting that message over to him to his to his ears not his teams right yeah you could do it it's an elbow grease but yeah it would work and you know honestly too as i'm thinking about like who i'd have on i never really thought about who's my dream guest like who do i until i asked you that question i'm always like who's the next person i get to have a conversation with and i'm focused Mm -hmm. on that and who's next and who's you know who who am i emailing now i never sat down and like made a list of who do i want to have on the show yeah it's always been I, like I, I have that, but I think more uh, visual. Like, so I I don't really dream about guests as I much dreaming about location and travel and studios. Yeah, in reach, in reach. Yeah. Um, I want to have a show, um, and that was the intention for 2020. Was we were going to actually bring the show in person and start traveling a little bit, mm. and then Corona happened. Sometimes the God has different plans. I guess. <laughs> and let me give you a little secret that I can say with absolute certainty. His plans are always better than ours. Just got to go with it. <laughs> Even You're though right, it's not I'm... what I want right now, but you know, he's got, he's got big plans for you. So just go with it and see where it leads. But I'll tell you one okay. thing really quickly about reach. Um, this is how I learned this the hard way. And maybe why I'm not so stuck on numbers and such. I mean, I like to use them for uh, to guide me, but I don't get emotional about them. When I was doing the TV circuit, the radio circuit, you know, doing the newspaper thing and the podcast, and I had all those things working at once, I was working my butt off. There was about a two and a half year period where I went down and crunched the numbers just to see what my reach was and to see what my, you know, how many people I'm getting in front of. And the number was north of 50 million in about a two and a half year stretch. So that's a lot of reach. But here's the, the kicker. At that time, I was young. I was like, again, mid 20s. And I had a book, but I didn't have any other offer. 
So even though I was in front of a lot of people and I was making ends meet, I wasn't thriving financially. Right. So that's why I'm looking at it. And I'm like, what's like, you can have them both. You can have a great reach and an offer and thrive financially, but you got to start somewhere and then build from there, I think. Yeah. So I don't think that necessarily right out of the gate, what most people think is how many downloads can I get? How much reach can mm -hmm. I get? I don't mm -hmm. think that's the first place you should start. I think you should start with how can I, how can I positively impact people's lives? What value right. can I offer? What problems can I solve? And based on the value that I bring, how can I reach the most people that need that? Yeah, 100%. 100%. That's why engagement rates, I was talking to somebody and they were sharing their numbers and I was like, okay, what's your engagement? And they're like, engagement, what? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, engagement is like one of the most important metrics in, in my mind right now, like yeah. our community and stuff like that, our open rates, people who are hitting reply, all those stuff is number one for me because, uh, you know, if I have a small pool, um, how engaged are those people, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's not just views. It's definitely engagement and engagement for the right reasons, not engaging yeah, because of follow true. for follow engagement, because <laughs> I see you're doing cool stuff and that interests me, right. or you may be able to solve the problem that I have, or I am really looking up to what you're doing. Yep. Yep. I want to, you know, follow you. Yep. So that, that's what I look at is the, it's not just engagement, it's the quality of the engagement. Amen. Amen yeah. to that. Well, Heather, thank you so much for the podcast and for this. This is so much fun. I love chatting with you. I remind people, heatherparody.com is your website and the Unconventional Leaders Podcast. Yeah. Definitely go subscribe, rate, review, all that good stuff. Thanks so much. Let's definitely do this again soon. Let's do it. It was an honor. Thanks.